Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to The Philip DeFranco Show and a quick announcement right here at the top. Words, I'm excited. I finally get to say the October drop is here and it has something for everyone. One, as promised, we got a refresh of the One Day Will All Be Skeletons line. With this run incorporating beautiful line art, fantastic colors. I also wanted to use, if, if you got the Emotionally Exhausted drop, you know, we really upped our game as far as the quality of our clothes. So we're releasing this on our premium hoodies, our premium shirts. We're also releasing it on a notebook since last drop. That was one of the surprise hits. I was happy to see there's a lot of people that like to write things down the old-fashioned way like myself. Also, in addition to that, two, a product that literally you guys came up with in the comments. The, let's just say this is coffee mugs. Also including a little hand-drawn old school monkey is kind of a, a throwback, especially since I don't like to include my name on products. And then of course, finally, three, easily one of the most requested products of the last five months. The, don't be stupid, stupid mask. I absolutely love it. Uh, it took us so long to launch it because I wanted to make sure if we did launch one that we launched it with a good partner, which is why I was so over the moon that I got to work with Adams. They create the only masks I wear and I love wearing. The comfort, the quality, the fit, just top tier. You know, it's a comfortable and breathable everyday mask with a polyester blend outer layer and a copper lined ionized quartz yarn inner layer. Also, if you buy several as a bundle, there's a discount. But yeah, very excited to announce this and it is all as of right now available on shopdefranco.com. And of course, remember this is a limited time only drop. It is first come first served, so grab it while you can. But with that said, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, otherwise I will punch you in the throat and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today, let's start off light, though it is 2020, so light is still a story that could impact over 45,000 jobs. This year, the bar has drastically shifted. But yeah, where we're gonna start today is with movies and more specifically, movie theaters. Our movie theaters have been shut down for a long time because of this pandemic, though we have been seeing theater chains slowly reopening in limited capacity. But there are still a lot of bumps in the road that needs to be traveled and also kind of just pits of doom, which I mean is why we're seeing Cineworld, which owns Regal Cinemas, announcing that it'll be shutting down its locations after Thursday. This with seemingly no reopening date in sight. This will impact 536 Regal Cinemas in the United States, 127 Cineworld and Picture House venues in the UK. As mentioned earlier, this will also impact over 45,000 jobs in those countries. And in addition to the pandemic making it harder for these theaters to do anything, I mean, you also have to think about the movies. Right? You have theaters that are reopening, limited capacity. They're, they need new blockbusters to get people to actually come in. But meanwhile, what we're getting are announcements like the release date for the new James Bond film. It has once again been delayed, going from this November to April 2021. Right? Studios rightly or wrongly delaying these films, it makes it harder for the movie theaters to make money. But, and I mean, especially after Tenet didn't bring in a ton of money domestically, it is very likely that a lot of studios will delay rather than trying to push something out now. Though, you do also have analysts like Eric Wold saying essentially studios need to suck it up. Saying, while we can understand the studio's desire to hold releases until the release environment is is perfect. We also believe studios must be willing to take a hit to feed the industry and keep the exhibitor group from completely falling apart. Although it should be noted that this is not the only issue when it comes to studios deciding whether or not to delay their films. And this is something that John Fithian, head of the National Association of Theater Owners, hit on, speaking to Variety and saying that another major reason that films keep getting bumped is because of New York. Right, it's one of the biggest markets in the world and they have not yet reopened theaters. Arguing the failure of Governor Cuomo to allow movie theaters to reopen anywhere in his state was a principal, if not exclusive, cause of the bond move. If New York remains closed to theater operations, other movies scheduled for 2020 will move as well. With him adding that since restaurants, gyms, and churches are open, that movie theaters should open as well in areas of the state that don't have spikes. Though for his part, back in August, Cuomo did explain why he doesn't think that the state should push for movie theaters reopening, or saying that they are less essential than other businesses, they pose a high risk. But yeah, ultimately that is where we are with this right now. We're gonna be looking out, see what happens next. For example, it's unclear right now if AMC, which is the largest chain in the United States, has any plans to follow suit here. Yeah, with this story, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts in general, but also uh, to those of you that have gone to a movie theater since uh, the, the pandemic originally started. What was the experience like after the fact? Did you feel safe? Also, for those that will not go, at what point do you think you would feel comfortable going back into a movie theater? Yeah, I'd love to know what you're thinking and why. And then let's talk about the big updates to the Brianna Taylor story, because if you didn't see, over the weekend, the recordings from the grand jury that oversaw her case were released. Right, and this because a judge ordered them to be made public after a juror filed a complaint claiming that Kentucky AG Daniel Cameron misrepresented the jury's discussion, saying that Cameron never offered them the option to bring homicide charges against the officers. This, despite the fact that he told the public he, quote, walked them through every homicide offense and saying it was the jury who decided to just charge Brett Hankison with three counts wanted endangerment. With that juror also accusing him of using the jury as a shield to deflect accountability and responsibility by basically
basically blaming them for not bringing charges. Now, that said, as far as what is on these tapes, very notably, they do not include the recommendations that Cameron gave to the jurors regarding what charges should be brought. And regarding that, in a statement, Cameron said that the recommendations he gave the jury were not recorded because they were not evidence. All right, so in other words, we basically didn't get any information whatsoever to answer the key question that's being asked here. But we still did get some new insights from these recordings. Recordings that showed that the officer's accounts to Louisville Metro Police investigators were sometimes jumbled, contradictory, and mistaken. Also showing that those investigators often failed to press them on this. For example, as one outlet reports, the recordings show that investigators didn't ask follow-up questions that would pinpoint what officers knew or didn't know about who and what they were shooting at in the apartment. One of the most notable examples is a statement given by Officer Miles Cosgrove, who fired the shot that ultimately killed Brianna. In his interview, he made conflicting statements that were not challenged by either of the sergeants questioning him. At one point, Cosgrove said that he never heard any gunfire, but at another, he said that he was deafened by it. Hinkison's statement also had a number of issues. For example, he said that when officers broke down the door, he saw a person inside with an AR-15 or a long gun, a rifle-type gun. Also saying that he ran to the breezeway and described hearing what he called rapid fire from from like an AR-15, with him telling interviewers he was 100% sure it was a long gun because he hunted. And there, for example, investigators didn't question him on that at all, despite the fact that investigators found that Walker had used a handgun, and no gun of the type that Hankison described was actually found in the apartment. Also significant from his testimony is the fact that Hankison said he did not know anything about the specifics of the investigation, other than that he needed a drug dog. Officer Jonathan Mattingly making a similar claim that the officers involved in the shooting didn't do any of the investigation before executing the warrant, but that has been called into question because of an LMPD report. A report that found that Officer Mattingly had actually asked another local police department to check with the post office and see if any packages were going to Taylor's address. Packages for the suspect in their narcotics investigation. Officers there told Mattingly that the suspect was not getting packages at her apartment. But when investigators asked Mattingly what he was told in the pre-operational briefing, he told them that the suspect had sent packages to Brianna in her name and that she was possibly holding drugs and money for him. All right, so obviously that is not all the information we got from the roughly 15 hours of these recordings, just some of the major ones. Another being that we also got to hear firsthand the witness accounts disputing the officers claimed they announced themselves, adding yet another contradictory element, though this one between witnesses and the police. All in all, right, not a ton of new information, just kind of more pieces to this narrative of how poorly all of this was handled, right, how contradictory some of these elements have been. But despite all of that, one of the really notable things in the recordings is that it did show that the jurors were at times skeptical or inquisitive about the recordings, asking the detectives many questions, pointing out inconsistencies in some of the officers' accounts, and even questioning what was provided to them. So that is significant, but without hearing what what Cameron said to the jury in their deliberations, we, we still don't know more of what we were actually wanting to know about. Right, which is also why it's not surprising that we've seen a continued and kind of new wave of criticisms and speaking out against Cameron. Right, from people of all times, right, people just following the story, Breonna Taylor's family, as well as, I mean, over the weekend we saw Megan the Stallion performing on SNL, and behind her we see the words of activist Tamika Mallory, right, essentially saying Daniel Cameron is no different than black people that sold our people into slavery. But yeah, as of right now, that is where we are with this story, and of course, I, I do pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on what was included and not included in these recordings? What are your thoughts on the story still in general? But from that end, before we get into the very, very big and polarizing deep dive, I wanted to share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Raycon. You know, Raycon is a company founded on the belief that premium audio should be affordable without the insane price markup. Started with audio engineers and some of the music industry's elite coming together to develop an awesome line of wireless earbuds at nearly half the price. And their everyday E25 earbuds are their best model yet. With six hours of playing time, a compact carrying case that can charge your earbuds four times with a single charge, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, compact design, and not to mention that they're stylish and come in a variety of colors as well. Also, not only do they look amazing, but more importantly, they are comfortable, sound great, and have a minimal design. Raycons are great for working from home, working out, listening to music and podcasts for hours, and they have a 45-day free return policy. That way, you can make sure that they are the pair of wireless earbuds for you. So, if you want to join me in owning a pair of your own, go to buyraycon.com slash defranco, or just click that link in the description down below to get 15% off your order today. And the first bit of awesome is a push since I did such a horrible job of pushing it last week. I put out a brand new podcast with Real Poker Kid, one of the best poker players in the world. So you can watch that now over at youtube.com slash ACW, but also for the next podcast after that, we have John Cozart, so look forward to that. We got the trailer for 537 Votes. You got Lily Collins teaching you British slang. BTS breaking down their albums. We had Game Tunes giving us Among Us Logic 3. We got a new trailer for Free Guy, which of course is that new Ryan Reynolds film. We got a lip sync battle with Millie Bobby Brown, which just gets all kinds of extra. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really any Anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. And of course, the last thing that we have to talk about today is President Trump being diagnosed with COVID-19, 
the fallout since, the confusion, the chaos, and uh, I will eventually get to my opinion on this. Okay, so we first got the news on Friday, just after midnight Eastern time, when we saw Trump tweet that he and Melania had tested positive. And that, coming just a few hours after it was announced that his senior counselor, Hope Hicks, had tested positive and that he and Melania were quarantining. From there, later in the morning, we saw White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows telling reporters that Trump had, quote, mild symptoms, as well as White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany saying that Trump had announced his coronavirus test result within an hour of receiving it. That afternoon, we saw the White House announcing that Trump had received a dose of Regeneron, which is an experimental drug cocktail that's shown promising results in improving COVID-19 symptoms. Later that evening, we see Trump tweet out a video. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. Right, so in general, when all of this news is breaking, I mean, it's kind of shocking. I mean, even with Donald Trump's in-your-face brazen disregard of what health officials are advising when it comes to COVID-19, it's still, the, the headline is still, President of the United States has COVID-19. Right, there's a lot of questions. How bad is it? When did he get it? Was he also spreading it? This is a guy who throughout the week was going through events. He debated Joe Biden. Over the weekend, he was at that mass gathering of people to announce the Supreme Court nominee. Also, how bad are his symptoms? How bad could this get? What does this mean regarding who is in charge and running the country. I mean, we also saw our fair share of conspiracy theories. And we'll touch on some of those later, but I mean, there was a lot of chaos and confusion. And I guess regarding that note, let's jump to Saturday morning. There, Trump's doctors hold a press conference where they said that Trump had a fever Thursday into Friday morning. But at that point, Trump had been fever free for 24 hours. With White House physician Sean Conley also telling reporters. Just 72 hours into the diagnosis now, the first week of COVID, and in particular days seven to 10 are the most critical in determining the likely course of this illness. At this time, the team and I are extremely happy with the progress the president has made. Thursday, he had a mild cough and some nasal congestion and fatigue all of which are now resolving and improving. You also had Dr. Brian Garibaldi saying that Trump received a quote, special antibody therapy, right? Regeneron 48 hours before the press conference. And I mentioned both of those statements because they have led to an overwhelming number of questions about when Trump was actually diagnosed with COVID-19. Right, you have Conley on Saturday saying that Trump was 72 hours into the diagnosis, which would mean that Trump actually tested positive on Wednesday morning. And same thing regarding timeline with Garibaldi. If Trump received Regeneron 48 hours before this press conference, that would put it somewhere around midday Thursday. Here's the thing, if that is true, that could be damning for Trump because on Wednesday night, he held an outdoor rally in Minnesota with him then on Thursday flying to New Jersey for a fundraiser, which included both indoor and outdoor events. And also here's a big thing regarding that. Let's say both of the doctors misspoke regarding the timeline. Even if we say that is true, which we're not saying that it is, Meadows himself said that Trump and his team knew that Hope Hicks had tested positive and that he had been exposed to her before the event. Yet he still decided to go to that fundraiser, even though others that she had contact with were pulled from the trip, right? And so I just want that to be understood as far as like, that is literally the lowest level of how bad this situation could be. It, it could only be worse than that. Right? So you see those doctors speak. And of course the next big question is, okay, well, did Trump go to these events while knowing that he had COVID-19, right? Timeline doesn't seem to match up. So we see reporters asking Conley to clarify when Trump first got the positive diagnosis. Conley just says that he did repeated testing on Trump Thursday afternoon and that late that night, the results confirmed that Trump was positive. Also notably refusing to answer when Trump's last negative test was. We also saw reporters asking about whether Trump had been put on supplemental oxygen at any point as had been reported while he was on his way to the hospital. Though so what we ended up seeing is Conley at first kind of dodging this question saying Trump was not currently on oxygen. However, he did ultimately say that Trump had not yet received any oxygen at all. So that press conference ends, but you of course still have a ton of questions. So there a few hours later, we see the White House walking back the timeline given by the doctor saying that Trump was diagnosed Thursday night. Conley then backing that up in a revised statement saying that he actually misspoke. But the conflicting reports that we've seen do not stop there. That same day, you have reporters quoting Mark Meadows as saying, the president's vitals over the last 24 hours were very concerning and the next 48 hours will be critical in terms of his care. We're still not on a clear path to a full recovery. Right, and that is obviously a lot different than the much more rosy picture that Trump's doctors presented. But as far as Trump himself goes, on Saturday we saw him saying that he felt well, calling COVID-19 a plague, and later releasing a video recorded from Walter Reed Medical Center. I came here, wasn't feeling so well. I feel much better now, but this was something that happened and it's happened to millions of people all over the world and I'm fighting for them, not just in the US, I'm fighting for them all over the world. We're gonna beat this coronavirus or whatever you wanna call it and we're gonna beat it soundly. Though so with this video, you also have people pointing to a moment that appears to be edited to remove Trump coughing. If you look at the therapeutics, 
which I'm taking right now. Which actually, on that note, brings us to yesterday when we saw Trump's doctors holding another press conference. There, Conley said that Trump's conditions have continued to improve. However, he also announced that Trump had been put on a drug that's used to reduce lung inflammation in COVID-19 patients who require supplemental oxygen. So again, you had that question pop up. Did Trump need oxygen at some point? And there, this time, you had Conley flat out saying, yes, Trump had received oxygen on Friday for about an hour while still at the White House. This, even though Saturday, you had Conley explicitly saying that Trump had not been put on oxygen. And to that point, we saw Conley say, I didn't want to give uh, any uh, any information that might uh, steer the uh, the course of illness in another direction, um, and in doing so, uh, you know, it came off uh, that we were trying to hide something, which wasn't necessarily true. Um, and uh, so have, here I have it. He's, he is, the, the effect of the matter is, is that he's doing really well. Conley also noting that Trump's oxygen levels had dipped below normal on Saturday, but said that he didn't know if Trump had been put on oxygen for that. Though it's now been confirmed that Trump was in fact given a second round of oxygen. So you have that, but then let's talk about the situation that gave us this moment. God bless our president. I will die for him. I will die for that man happily. I will die for him. Anybody want to mess with him? You mess with me first. He is a hero, that man. Cool, Gary, I thought we were just going to Wendy's. Uh, but yeah, Donald Trump teased and then actually went out in a motorcade, waving to all his supporters who showed up outside of the hospital. You know, essentially it was a photo op, one that White House spokesperson Judd Deere said was cleared by the medical team as safe to do, adding that precautions like personal protective equipment were taken to protect Trump, White House officials, and Secret Service agents. But we've also seen health professionals like James Phillips, an attending physician at Walter Reed, saying every single person in the vehicle during that completely unnecessary presidential drive-by just now has to be quarantined for 14 days. Days. They may get sick, they may die. For political theater, commanded by Trump to put their lives at risk for theater. This is insanity. Other medical experts also making similar statements. And look, even according to the CDC's own guidelines, transport of COVID-19 patients is supposed to be limited only to medically essential purposes. We've also seen reports of an unnamed active Secret Service agent saying, that should have never happened. I mean, I wouldn't want to be around them. The frustration with how we're treated when it comes to decisions on this illness goes back before this though. We're not disposable. Right, and with all that said, while the president having COVID on its own is a huge deal. It is also incredibly significant because we've seen a lot of other people around him testing positive as well. This, including a number of high profile Republicans who have been around the president in the last week, such as RNC chairwoman, Ronna McDaniel, former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, former White House advisor, Kellyanne Conway, senators Mike Lee and Tom Tillis, as well as Trump staffers, including his campaign manager. And the thing is, as time goes on, we keep adding to the list. Today, for example, Kaylee McEnany, who was speaking to the press just yesterday without a mask, she, as well as two of her deputies have tested positive today. But it's also not just high profile Republicans and people in the administration. I mean, you have reports like three unnamed journalists having tested positive. Also on Friday, Cleveland officials said in a statement that 11 people tested positive stemming from pre-debate planning and setup. And so there have been these concerns of who else is going to have it? When did this start spreading? Right? Because there is this question of how many people who take coronavirus seriously, right? They're wearing their mask. They're trying to do their best. But notably, as has been repeated, the mask is more for everyone else and not just yourself. So how many of those people who are trying their best were around these other people who didn't care as much. It's part of the reason why there was so much concern of, was Joe Biden going to test positive? And the reason for that was, well, I mean, one, it was a chaotic situation. Everyone was asking every question, but also two, it is becoming more and more believed that the super spreader event actually happened on September 26th. Right? That being the Rose Garden event where Trump announced Amy Coney Barrett's nomination. So far, we know that nine people who have tested positive also attended that event. Right? And from this event, we saw a lot of pictures and videos circulating. People closely packed together, not wearing masks. We see a lot of touching, hugging. You also had the New York Times showing pictures of lots of people who attended that event inside the White House right after with no social distancing, very few masks in sight. Also, regarding this Rose Garden event, right, it's about the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Interestingly enough, this could pose a complication for her nomination process, especially because the two senators who attended this event were found positive for this virus, Tillis and Lee. They are both members of the Judiciary Committee, which approves the nomination before it goes to the full floor. And what's more is that actually another Republican by the name of Senator Ron Johnson has now also tested positive for the virus. And while he was not present at the Rose Garden event, it is also unclear if his cases connected to the White House cluster. But the fact that three Republicans now have COVID is incredibly significant for the confirmation process for a few reasons. First of all, they could have unknowingly spread it to even more Republican senators, right? According to reports, Senate Republicans meet three times a week for in-person lunches where they eat and talk without masks, and all three positive senators attended lunches this week. Though, it should be noted, despite all of that, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said over the weekend that he is still pushing ahead with the same schedule for Barrett's nomination. With the hearing set to start next week, the nomination scheduled to get a full Senate vote by the end of the month, just days before the election. 
direction as far as how this could move forward with the senators having COVID. Over the weekend, you had Lindsey Graham, who chairs the committee, saying that any senator who wants to can participate in the hearing by video. And with this news, you had Democrats furious, right? in addition to saying that Republicans are continuing to try to jam through this nominee as fast as possible before the election. They also condemned Republicans for now forcing them to either show up in person, risk endangering themselves, or if they opted to be safe instead of being around a bunch of other people that might have it. They would essentially have to Zoom call in to a hearing for a lifetime appointee to the highest court. And even beyond that, because of rules for in-person voting in the Senate, this could complicate the numbers Republicans need to get Barrett's nomination passed in the committee and even in the full Senate. And here's the thing, as we get closer to the hearings, as we get further in the week and see if more people test positive, any sort of updates, we're gonna dive deeper into this aspect, right? There's gonna be a lot to talk about, big updates over the next two weeks. For example, just today, as I was finishing up today's show, we've now already seen Trump tweeting that he's set to leave Walter Reed later this evening. But where I wanna end this story, where I want to end this video, I kind of wanna just end it on my reaction because over the past 72 hours, that's what we've seen is just reaction after reaction. And where I'll start here is, is once again, it is shocking news, but also not shocking news when you think about it. Like when this was announced and we started seeing initial developments, I saw so many conspiracy theories. Right? A number of people saying, there's no way he has COVID. This is a lie. This is some sort of strategy to get the sympathy vote or get out of debates or insert whatever reason. And then soon after you had conspiracies going the other way, people posting pictures, circling things, saying, oh, the president He's traveling with a portable oxygen concentrator in his pocket. It goes up his back, it's hidden in his hair, and it's tucked under his mask. Which, by the way, has been debunked. And here's the thing, I understand the distrust. I understand why there are conspiracy theories. We have been trained for years now to not trust what is presented to us by this man or his administration. Right? You immediately go, how is he lying and how is this self-serving? But I think it is often the case that sometimes the most simple answer is the real answer. This is a guy that has consistently downplayed the virus. He's mocked people for wearing masks in the past. He's traveling a lot, he has a number of people around him, you don't see social distancing, you don't see masks. Why should you expect anything other than that guy gets infected? And as far as how it serves him, is there a sympathy vote out there for him? Maybe there's a few. But I also don't understand that mindset. Like if I was a politician and I was like, you know what, you know, I think we need to remove stoplights, raise the speed limit, and I'm gonna mock people who are putting airbags in their cars. Right, and so if I got into a crash, I think that a lot of people would be like, well, you brought that on yourself. But I think that most Americans, when they look at the situation, they're like, oh, well, this is a situation of his own creation. He did this to himself and what I would also say personally. And where I land on this is I'm not saying, hey, thoughts and prayers to the president. I'm not saying, hey, I'm happy. I hope the worst happens. I, I land in between and in between is I just have no sympathy for that man. Don't forget his handling of this pandemic. Yes, it appears to have led to him getting COVID, the people around him getting COVID. But also by the end of the day, I will have the ability to factually say that over 210,000 Americans have died from COVID-19, a disease that just two weeks ago, Trump said. It affects Virtually nobody. Right, a man who over the weekend after getting COVID-19 said. So uh, it's been a very interesting journey. I learned a lot about COVID. I learned it by really going to school. This is the real school. This isn't the let's read the book school. But the thing is, Mr. President, if you had listened to people that went to school specifically for stuff like this, one, maybe you wouldn't have gotten it. And two, maybe all those people who died how many of them would have not died? How many tables in America would have an extra body or two there? Right, 210,000, it is such an unthinkable number. You know, there was a memorial held outside of the White House, so an empty chair is meant to represent those who died from COVID. Right, you just look at those chairs and you think, wow, each one of those represents a person, but actually, in fact, each one of those represents 10 people. Because COVID-19 is still actively taking life, it still doesn't even touch the real number. And so when I see people like Rachel Maddow, like making a case for there to be a lot of sympathy for the president, I say, what? I'm not saying I want or even hoping that the worst happens to President Trump here. I just cannot feel sympathy for someone that could have made this so much less painful for the people that he's supposed to be leading. The failures, the lies, the downplaying of this serious threat, the mockery of actual health advice that could save lives. This isn't your grandpa saying some stupid shit on Facebook. This is the president of the United States. This is the person with pretty much the most power in the world, the highest office in the world. But yeah, that is where I'm gonna end this story, my personal takeaway. And you know, if you're one of these people that you're like, ah, I wanna get rid of Trump, I, I hope that he dies of COVID. How about you use that energy instead to just vote him and all of his enablers out? Which on that note, if you live in Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Indiana, Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, or Texas, it is last call, you beautiful bastard. You have until midnight tonight to register to vote. I'll link to details down below, but it is an ASAP situation. Also, if you live in Illinois, Nevada, 
Nevada, New Mexico, you have until tomorrow to register in person or by mail. Also, in a number of states right now, you can actually vote in person early. Literally every day, I will be linking resources down below in case you're like, hey, did that happen here? Also some recent additions since we last covered that. Yesterday, in-person voting started in Maine and Minnesota. As of today, Californians, Iowans, Nebraskans, Rhode Islanders, and South Carolinians can do the same. And on Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll see Indiana, Ohio, and Arizona opening up for in-person voting as well. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives into the news. Also, if you're new here, definitely hit that subscribe button. Maybe even text me at 813-213-4423. Get notifications for new videos directly from me behind the scenes. Also, very cool things like uh, the drop that we just launched today, for example. A bunch of your critiques and notes actually helped us with the final product, which by the way, once again, just launched at shopdefranco.com. Go check it out. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow.